All right, so this is a class lesson for SI number three. Um, before I begin, I should say you need to have your slide printout for SI number three. That will help you uh, be able to write some things down on the slides and incorporate uh, some of the additional information. Now note on the title slide, there's a quote taken from your textbook. It says, Europe is a laboratory atop a graveyard. The graveyard is a reference to World War I and all the, the deaths, both military and civilian, that Europe experienced. And because of what I'm calling the death effect, there's going to be an experimentation uh, that's going to take place in in between World War One and World War Two, with different ideologies, and it's going to be this clash of ideologies that will be part of the cause of World War Two. So SI number three just kind of gives us a bit of an introduction into the ideology experimentation after World War One. The death effect, uh, this is the chart reused in the World War I unit. It should remind you of some of the statistical facts. Look at the grand total of killed in World War I, over 8.5 million. Look at the wounded, over 21 million. Clearly, World War I has a, a catastrophic loss of human life. In Germany alone, in 1914, they lost one-third of its men, ages 19 through 22. These are the Paul Bombers. On top of that, um, not only in Europe, but throughout the world, many, many millions of people died because of Spanish influenza. So collectively, the Spanish influenza and World War I casualties create what's called the lost generation. People literally lost, dead, and others who uh, survived these years are kind of lost emotionally and psych psychologically. Um, and it's going to be this lostness that is going to kind of breed some of the ideological experiments uh, in the years between the wars. Now, one of the factors of the death effect that's real important is pacifism. Because there was so much loss of life and um, really a life and death struggle in the World War I years, um, the mood within Europe and even the United States really uh, clung to this idea of pacifism, which is a belief that um, you should not utilize violent means to carry out politi political objectives. It's really this idea of uh, nonviolence for peace. Now, what you see there, the, the prohibited books list from 1932 to 1939. You might remember back in the first semester, we talked about how the Catholic Church created its own prohibited books list uh, of anything that was Protestant or even scientific or social uh, works of uh, novels and literature that confronted um, Catholic belief systems and doctrines uh, were put on a prohibited books list. Now this prohibited book list that you see just a portion listed on the slide is the prohibited books list in Germany from the years 1932 to 1939, which is the Nazi Germany years, the years in which Adolf Hitler um, takes over and, and uh, controls government. And if, if you look, I have uh, selected these authors particularly because you have Remark listed there, Eric Maria Remark. This is your author of All Quiet on the Western Front. Adolf Hitler hated that book because that book is an anti-war book that communicates the nature of war in very real terms and in part helped to create a view of pacifism and support pacifism and applaud pacifism. 
So when Hitler comes to power to rebuild the country of Germany in a strong nationalistic terms, he wanted to eliminate all pacifistic voices, all anti-war voices. And uh, Eric Maria Remark was uh, one such voice. And uh, his book, All Quiet on the Western Front, which you have read, uh, was, was widely ap applauded. And so um, Hitler uh, ordered that book, amongst others, uh, to be destroyed. Literally, they would collect the books and, uh, and have book burnings in, in towns throughout Germany. So that goes to show you um, you know, the, 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 the fact that pacifism was alive and well, uh, that even Hitler viewed that to be uh, a dangerous ideology that might prevent him from rebuilding a militaristic Germany. Now this slide here, you have the photograph of Karl Marx and a political cartoon of Karl Marx. You might remember Karl Marx co-authored with Friedrich Engels, The Communist Manifesto in 1848. Um, the political cartoon with Karl Marx all beat up is demonstrating how the Communist Manifesto was um, responded to when it was published. There, there really was not much support for the communist ideology in 1848. Um, but the communist ideology will lay dormant and will pop up. In 1917, the Soviet Union is created in Russia. This is the first time that a country in human history will uh, apply the, uh, the political and, and social and economic views of communism. Um, now, you remember in the World War I unit, you did an essay on the Russian Revolution. So this is just kind of reviewing some of that Russian Revolution information. Uh, it occurred right in uh, the midst of World War I. And when the Bolsheviks, which are also known as the Reds, which are also known as the Communists, those are all synonymous terms, defeated a coalition of Russian forces, forces known as the Whites, um, led by Vladimir Lenin, they instituted for the first time the, a communist government. Um, when Lenin died, there would be a power struggle within the communist leadership, and Joseph Stalin will uh, come out victorious. And so he will be the second premier that uh, leads the Soviet Union. And I have him circled here on this slide just to signify that it's going to be Joseph Stalin that will be the Soviet leader during the World War II years. So as we're studying World War II, um, Joseph Stalin will, will, will come into play as a key figure which, of course, is a consequence of the Russian Revolution, which was from World War I era. Now, really, the core of this SI is kind of taking a look at how there are going to be competing ideologies in Europe following World War I. And this is the laboratory upon a de the, uh, the graveyard. Um, you're going to have a tension, political tension, between the political system of democracy versus totalitarianism. So there will be some voices that will say democracy is a flawed political system, and that what would work best is having a political system in which you have one person or one group in total control. You'll notice that totalitarianism, the root of that word is total. So they have total political control. Now this is not a new idea. This idea could be consistent with the absolutists that we studied in first semester. Capitalism versus socialism is going to be uh, another set of competing ideologies. And so, of course, this always goes back to even uh, the Industrial Revolution and, and how uh, the different economic systems of capitalism and socialism seem to uh, rival with one another. Um, but Marxism, Karl Marx, communism, is probably the most dominant socialistic ideology that has uh, you know been put into practice in human history we've already talked about the rise of the Soviet Union and Lenin and Stalin um, and so we'll see uh, that tension uh, continue on in the World War II story uh, we have a militarism versus pacifism which I've already talked about with the death effect 
you'll see nationalism versus globalization. Uh, globalization comes to the forefront when you have organizations like the League of Nations being created for the first time. That's really tying nations of the world or the globe together rather than standing by themselves as a single nation. So we see a, a, a tension of sovereignty and power uh, between a global design and a national design. Uh, communism versus fascism is going to be um, a huge clash in the years between the wars. Now, I want to focus on this. Um, there is a chart, fascism versus communism, that I will give to you um, that will even explain this with more detail. But I, I, I need to powerfully state that fascism and communism are not the same. And yet, oftentimes, people will use these words together as if they are exact. Um, they look the same on the surface. Just look at the chart. Fascism, the greatest the fascist leader that we have in this era is Adolf Hitler, who comes to power in Germany. And he creates a state-controlled totalitarian regime and uses power murderously to carry out his social agenda of exterminating the undesirables, particularly Jews. We're talking about the Holocaust here. And if you look at the communist side, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union does the exact same thing. A communist state-controlled system using a totalitarian government and using power to murder even more people in the Soviet Union than Hitler has murdered in Europe. So on the surface, they look exactly the same because they have the totalitarian political regime and abuse of power. But they have completely different value systems. On the fascist side, fascism is an extreme form of nationalism. Not just the patriotic sense and love for a nation, but taking a love for a nation to such an extreme in which the nation is the most important thing. Look at the bold. In a fascist society, one, an individual, is asked to do whatever it takes to lift up and glorify the nation. So there isn't really a sense of individual rights in a fascist. You give up your rights to be able to be subservient and to serve the nation itself. On the other side, on communism, communism, root of the word, is community, communal. And what the value system of social, uh, communism is, is to be able to provide for the community so that there is no division, there's no class, that everybody is the same or that everyone is equal. So equality becomes the highest value system of communism. So you can kind of see uh, one is looking up to the nation and one is asking the nation to look down and to provide uh, all the basic necessities uh, for the community of people the, in society. So they have kind of different visions of what they produce in the end, but they both use a totalitarian form of government as kind of the tool or implement to fulfill their value systems. Now, isolationism is an important term because this ter term clarifies what the the United States mood is following World War One. Even though we served in that war as a warring nation for a short time compared to the others, the United States public really connected with some of the catastrophe of World War One. And the general mood was let's stay isolated from Europe. We do not want to entangle ourselves and any foreign alliances that might pull us into a future conflict. And believe it or not, this was really kind of the, the standard belief system of the United States for most of its history. Even George Washington in his first uh, presidential administration kind of clarified this vision for the United States. So isolationism really is a returning back to our roots as a nation following the advice of George Washington in the years before World War I. Why risk American peace and prosperity over the interests of European nations? And because of this strong isolationist viewpoint, 
that the nation had, uh, that that viewpoint was also reflected in the U.S. Congress, particularly in the U.S. Senate, which was led by uh, the majority of Republicans who were strongly isolationists. And when Woodrow Wilson came back from Europe with the Treaty of Versailles, it had to go through a debate and voting process in which the U.S. Senate rejected the Treaty of Versailles because of some of the uh, obligations that the Treaty of Versailles might have placed on the United States, which I'll get to at the end of the SI. Another uh, kind of dominant value system that's kind of percolating through the minds and hearts of uh, Europeans and the United States is disarmament. So the disarmament movement was really an effort to demilitarize, to to scale back the numbers of troops, to uh, to scale back the amount of weapons that the nations fighting in World War One possessed. So remember, the United States rationale to go to war was that this will be the war to end all wars. Let's go to war now on the Western Front so that no wars like this will happen in the future. Obviously, uh, a tragically um, ideal lot idealistic uh, vision that uh, that fails in the end because we have a World War II. But nonetheless, there's a strong effort with the League of Nations, there's a strong effort with the Washington Naval Conference, and also the Kellogg-Briand Pact to have nations agree with one another to uh, disarm and disband their militaries. If you take a look at the poster, Um, the poster does take a look at some of the effects of war. You see the de destructed, burnt out building. Um, you see the, the dead mother figure, the baby. And uh, so th these are some strong uh, visions of what war produces, um, which would lead people to find that the solution to peace in the future would be to demilitarize. Now, the tragic irony is that as France, Great Britain, the United States begin to demilitarize their military forces, Germany, who is prohibited by the Treaty of Versailles to have military forces, will violate those conditions and begin to rearm itself. So the irony is, as Germany threatens and brings about a World War II, the Western nations, Great Britain, France, and the United States particularly, have dismantled themselves, which are really not putting themselves in a great position to confront the rebuilt German military under Adolf Hitler. One side note, when President Wilson came back from Europe, knowing that the U.S. Senate was in opposition to the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles. He went on a train tour. You can see the train tour route identified in the bold line on the map. He went from town to town, city to city, communicating directly to the United States public to please put pressure on their senator to be able to pass the Treaty of Versailles. And ultimately, the political pressure um, and the, the whirlwind trip um, caused Woodrow Wilson to go um, through a stroke that completely um, made him incapable physically and mentally uh, from carrying on the, the duties of the president. Now, all of this was kept secret. The general public did not know that the president had become so ill, um, even to the point where the decisions uh, in the White House were made by his wife, Edith Wilson. You can see identified there as a secret president. And of course, other uh, members of, of his advisory staff that worked in the White House uh, during his presidency. In essence, what I'm trying to say is that this political crisis that he faced with Congress over selling the League of Nations, uh, and particularly the Treaty of Versailles, uh, cost him his life. Now, looking at this political cartoon, 
I'll ask the first question. What World War I event do you need to know in order to understand the political cartoon? And hopefully, what first comes to mind is the Lusitania. Now, seeing icebergs in the image, you might have also thought of the Titanic, which is not a World War I event, but certainly an oceanic uh, tragedy. And that would be a fair thing to consider also, as this ship who is waiting, is, uh, operating through the water is certainly in danger of uh, sustaining some kind of damage because of the icebergs. Now, notice the icebergs are labeled. The League of Nations is one of them. Foreign entanglements is one of them. Foreign treaties is another. So it's these ideas that are going to potentially threaten and harm, maybe even sink, the passenger liner, which is identified as the United States. If you read the caption, the caption says, better keep to the old channel. The old channel would be a reference to the isolationist um, mode that the United States has been in for much of its history, staying away from foreign entanglements. So you can see here in the political cartoon, it's very much uh, stating um, kind of the U.S. Senate attitude that the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations collective security provision might endanger the United States in the future if we ratify or agree or support the Treaty of Versailles. So this is all getting to why the U.S. Senate rejected the Treaty of Versailles. Ultimately, the treaty is rejected. We're never a participant of the Treaty of Versailles or the League of Nations uh, because it was not ratified. Here you see Uncle Sam being bound by the League of Nations, the ribbons of the League of Nations, and kind of pulled in various directions. So it was the collective security portion of the League of Nations, which asks nations of the world to send military forces globally to confront belligerent nations, uh, was that part of the treaty that the U.S. Senate rejected. Because this idea of collective security is completely opposite of the, the mood of isolationism. We do not want to be pulled into a conflict according to Collective Security League of Nations requirements. And uh, this political cartoon just shows you the U.S. Senate opposition to what the League of Nations uh, might have required us to have to do with a military force in the future had we been part of the League of Nations.